Well, we are back at the British Shooting Show 2020. It's the Friday, and we are halfway through day one. A great deal has happened already. We've seen Ollie from Love Island, but now I have the most enormous, the greatest of pleasures in introducing you to possibly my favourite person in the whole of the gun trade, Terry Doe. Terry, welcome. Thank you very much, Charlie, for those sincere words. Is that, is that applause I heard there? Is that, is, that, is, that, is that the sound effect for applause? Well, I thought I'd bring some silly applause and stuff in. Thank I you. know he's going to be a funny character. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for that. Let's talk, uh, uh, let's talk about your whole life. <laughs> I could have been on Love Island, you know. They just wouldn't have needed a bigger island. That was all. <laughs> I could have been there. And, and fact, yes, l- larger mates, perhaps. No, you're, you're, you're just the right size. Can, can, we talk about, uh, can we talk about air gunning as you knew it when you first started? Um, Blimey. Take me, take me back. Uh, right, it, it's a long way back. I, um, I was lucky enough to be born in the middle of what was then Buckinghamshire, literally in a field, in a caravan in a field. So I, I that was five steps away from tracking rabbits and, and things like that. And um, I shot my first rabbit uh, that went out my father with a 410 shotgun when I was four. I suspect, looking back, that this poor rabbit must have had Mixie. But... Um, I insisted on taking ownership of the dead rabbit and I carried it around with me for days and days and various adults tried to steal it away and, and dispose of it for me. But um, <laughs> It was like a cuddly toy. I would not have <laughs> anything else. I wanted to sleep with it and everything. You know. <laughs> and, no, I've, um, I've seen that. I've seen kids shoot their first rabbit and that happens. You know, they, they, they actually want to sort of hold it and cuddle it. But it, it's difficult for children to kind of make that distinction. That it, is, it goes from being yeah. a nice fluffy thing to being food. I, did, I didn't even have that. So I didn't, we didn't have any toys and stuff. I don't want to do the Monty Python sketch or anything, but <laughs> we were not well off. We had a, a single standpipe 100 yards away from, where, from our caravan, and running water literally meant running and getting it <laughs> on, a, on a pram frame in these enormous chrome churns that two of us required to push the, the, um, the filled churns. And on the way up, one of them was required to hold the, the churns apart so they didn't clang, and your aunties and uncles didn't hear it and wave at you and say, mine next, do mine next. And um, you, you lived in, in constant fear. It, you know, we, we would be filling these churns up, and the, um, the kids in the houses would be throwing stones at us. And so that's when I kind of learned, first learned to shoot a catapult then, just to, as a <laughs> self-defense weapon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, quite, this is quite an important part of your life. And I'm not sure everybody, oh, we, uh, we have this saying of noise is off. <laughs> oh, we, we have to take a short advertising intermission <laughs> while somebody talks over us in the background. So these pause are being given 30 seconds. We can fill, though. We can fill with all sorts of interesting <laughs> things. Well known for filling. <laughs> Actually, I'm like a custard cream, really. <laughs> oh, that's better. Um, people don't know that you, or many people don't know that you have got a very strong, very, very obvious traveller heritage. I'm a Romany. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Romany. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't use the word gypsy or traveller. I'm a Romany. Um, gypsy actually is a is a term coined in the in the days of Henry VIII when um, he was bonkers. Henry was clearly, um, clearly. nothing at all to do with your ancestors or anything like that. But he was raving mad, and he thought that my lot at the time were harbouring emissaries from Rome so he killed us for that um, because obviously the the the, uh, the Pope were trying to throttle the monarchy with rosary beads at the time and also they they thought that the Romani people were descendants from um, Egyptian temple worshippers Egyptian gypsy Egyptian so, so the crime became acting in the manner of an Egyptian oh, and that's where the name gypsy comes from so it's not kind of what I want to be known as so no, uh, you haven't got much Egyptian in you not you? a lot of Egyptian no I can walk like one <laughs> <laughs> but, we'll, uh, well, we'll see that after. So anybody <laughs> watching the video version of that can, but, uh, can now no. watch. So I'm a Romani. That's basically where we all started off in East India and we sort of mooched throughout the world. And uh, our language is um, basically Hindi with, with some pickups along the way. But I'm a very proud Englishman. I, I carry the, the St. George's cross on my inside of my right arm and the Romani flag on the inside of my left. So wh- whichever way I cross my chest, <laughs> the two things most dear to me are cross my heart. And that's, that's who I am. It's what you're feeling. It's a so Romani and the kind of English landowning class have never been that best friends, have they? Really? <laughs> so yeah, you're lost to the diplomatic court, I'm Charles. Trying as so we know. Hard. No, no, no. I said in French. A little bit of you know, a little bit of put and take. Um, I, I'm I'm a staunch defender of, of everything I believe in. You know, my shooting, uh, my fishing, my my ways. Um, a lot of people. There's a lot of people judge us in the now, and I can understand why people would be scared and, and fearful and resentful and all that sort of stuff. What they don't understand is, for instance, my parents, lovely people, my parents, although obviously I would say that, they went through a full-on apartheid regime. 
when they were younger. Segregation at school, they couldn't even hang their coats with the non-Romani kids. They had to wave goodbye to their classmates, their non-Romani classmates, as they went off on school outings. They weren't allowed to go. Um, they had different start times and, and finishing times, even though their parents worked together in the fields around Buckinghamshire. We all worked together. But, and then the war break broke out and the evacuees were sent from London and, and the Romani kids were thrown out of their school altogether. So it, you can understand how that would have set up a little bit, a little sort of a bit of resentment on behalf of my people. But they didn't. They sent me to that same school. And Even though that's what they've been yeah, through? Yeah, they've been through it. But, but uh, you know, it, it had had a regime uh, change after that. They went to speak to a very enlightened headmaster and headmistress. Things had changed. And they, in, in an act of, of unfor unfathomable um, trust, they... they gave their most precious possessions to the people or the, or the system that had abused them terribly. It seems extraordinary, doesn't it? It is amazing what they did. And um, I remember my mum saying to me, I went to school at four, I was, I was lucky enough to be reading at, at sort of early ages and stuff, and um, she said, our ways will go, your ways, you must get on with them, meaning the non romans Well, well she, 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 has, she has a point, actually, I'd like to get back to you, but just before I get there, the... the the, the scene you described of the local boy throwing stones at you, yeah. was, was that because basically you, you were an Egyptian as yeah, far as yeah. I was concerned? <laughs> that was because I was a gypsy and, um, and we were at war. Right. But, but, you know, casual racism is, is something that people are brought up with. Um, they were house dwellers. We, lived, we were the mysterious people in the caravans. And they threw stones at us while I was collecting water. And we would, you know, we'd, we'd have various fights and things at school and all sorts of horrible stuff. Um, but it, it took a visionary like that generation of parents to say okay the, the, the future has to be integration it has to be getting along and um, and they did and I, I went to school I stayed on at school I wasn't a particularly brilliant scholar I always wanted to be in the fields I I set snares on the cross-country course instead of <laughs> going home and doing my homework and things but um, I it well, was there and I, I turned you into the manual today oh, well I, I make I make a living doing something reasonably academic you know I'm a writer and well uh, you you have this I'm afraid you've you've become the person your your mother warned you about haven't you <laughs> pretty much pretty much she loved me really but she I, I did confuse her occasionally yes when I was in my developmental period when well, I was a bit wild I, I mean, mean there was there is a sort of you know there's a first world we know what that is there's a third world which mm. is poor nations there is a fourth world which not many people me know means a kind of nomadic traveling world mm. whether that is you know uh, Sami herders in the north of Norway or Mongolians mm. or you, you, a traveller. Yeah. Does that? Uh, do you identify yourself as a as a fourth world person, or have not, you shifted to? To first be honest, world? not really, because I didn't travel much. I've travelled only a few miles. My father was living in a full barrel wagon thing, you know, travelling around the country, going hot picking, and then going to the various sort of uh, farms and things like that. You know, as a child, he slept under the wheels of the wagon. He didn't even get didn't make it upstairs into the actual wagon. They had some canvas wrapped around the wheels, and he slept on a straw sack. Um, using various dogs as sort of his eider downs to warm him up and he, he had rats under there for company and he often woke he told me with frost in his hair you know he had it tough that old boy yes. and he's still about now and um, he's a much beloved man in his village and a very re highly respected man um, and he's made the, he made the, a, a great change but he's still proud of his roots as I am Yes. Um, but he's, he still has an eye uh, and a consciousness on the future, which we all must have. But it's pride, pride in roots seems to be very important. I mean, t tell me about, uh, I follow you on Facebook, and one of the things I love is, is, is your chats about the local church, which, yeah. which you're very keen on. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell me yeah. about that. Well, for a start, I'm, I'm the least churchy person in the world. I'm not, I'm not a practicing Christian much. But what, we've, what my family has always done for the last sort of 70 years or so, we've looked after the churchyard at St. Michael's in Horton, and it's passed down. My father is, is still doing a bit, but I... I sort of taken over from him and um, his brother-in-law before him did it and we have these regular work parties where we you know we restore um, ex-servicemen's monuments to um, to, to a, a quite a startling and ple pleasing degree and we keep the place nicely um, uh, the grass cut the ivy trimmed the graves all tidy and it, it's a, our way of giving something to the wider community and to our own community, because it, segregation existed there. We were all buried in one, yes, one of course. side. Yes, exactly. and, uh, but it's okay, you know, we're cool with that. But we love that churchyard. We love what it represents. We love the people in there who shaped us and who gave us everything we are good, you know, good about us today. And also it, it, it serves the wider community, the non-Romani community. And every year we have a big service there called Travelling Home that um, I get up and sort of waffle on and we have 
um, we break bread. We have what's traditional Romani food, and you know we've had squirrels and all Great. sorts of things. We have squirrels, rabbits, um, pigeons, uh, pheasants. We have all these stews we used to live on, and the bacon roly-poly, and all this sort of stuff. And we've always found over the years the best way to get along with someone is to break bread with them. It's, it's so true. Yeah, it's so true. I think that's, that, that crosses all cultures. It does. It does. I spent a very little bit of time years and years and years ago with uh, an Inuit community in northern Labrador. And it seemed to me that they were a fourth world nation who were trying to get their heads around the problem that if they continued to be a fourth world nation, they would not get health care and they'd not get mm. education. Mm. And therefore, they're having to become a first world yeah. nation. And they hated that. And they were, I mean, afraid some of them were committing suicide because of mm. that kind of awful well, cultural crunch. I, I What's the future that. for travellers? It, it is integration. It is integration. We've got to, I mean, this is this, it's going to sound hideously idealistic, but we have to hang on to the good things that kept us together, that kept us through the years of persecution. We have to hang on to the to the veneration of the children and the adults without spoiling them, the kids. We have to hang on to the good stuff and embrace the, the wider community. We have to do that. And, and most of us are, and, and society generally moves that way anyway. But we mustn't lose sight of where we came from. We mustn't lose sight of the good things that, that we've taken from that. But we also need to look at the challenges and the things that aren't acceptable and the things that we need to change to make ourselves part of the, the wider community without losing our identity. You've got, a, you've got a manifesto there. Part of what gives you your identity, your particularly, mm. uh, your identity, uh, not everybody in the Roman community is this sort of wonderful one for the pop culture, which, which exists across the whole of Britain, mm. I think, rural Britain, mm. certainly. So you, we've got as far as you're four years old. Yeah. What happens yeah. after that? No, well, I just, I was feral. I was a feral child. I didn't have um, anything that you plugged in. Um, I didn't have anything that was bought to entertain me much. An occasional toy would be brought back from the, uh, the emerging town of Slough, as it was. <laughs> but it was bows and arrows and spears and, um, and it, gradually air guns. Um, but it was, I spent an entire life in pursuit of things, um, exploring things, camping out, uh, attempting to sleep out and being dragged home. Um, just communing with the land, really. That's, that's still who I am. I still can't go without it for too long before I have to sleep outside. But how did you turn from that child into a kind of, a, 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 I'm nearly going to call you a literary icon, you know, you, how, did you, how did you become the kind of the great writer of the air gun world with small well, W? How did, what, what was that I move? was outed. <laughs> I, I was outed. I was. Who was self-identifying air I was outed by, um, we, had a, we had a hideous headmaster. He was, the man was a sadist um, at my secondary school who, um, he was mad. You'd have got on really well with him, Charlie. He, <laughs> he once convened a, a, an extraordinary assembly and he stood, he, he stood on the stage with a mic going and he had a sheet in his hand. And I thought, right, he's going to do something about the Ku Klux Klan or something like that. He's gonna, and he tore it in front of the microphone. Ooh, ow. He said, that, you won't know this, but that is the sound of a Spandau machine gun. Ugh. I thought he's going to kill us. He's he that's it. <laughs> this is the sound the of The curtains one. are going to come up, <laughs> and the geography true. teacher is going to spray <laughs> the audience or something. But what he's, he went on to say was that your fathers and your grandfathers faced this to give you the freedom to go around and drop litter in the school. Ooh, and ow. there was his collective sigh. <laughs> oh, oh, it's about litter. He's not going to kill us. He's not going to kill us. <laughs> but I'm, I caused the great mistake because he called two lads on with dustbin bags, and in those days the dustbin bags were paper. And you, put, you hung them on a spike in a cage for your dustbin. They weren't plastic. They were paper, double skin paper. I remember them. And he'd given them a pointy stick. And he said, punishment, you're late or something. Go and collect some litter. Yeah. And he said, in just half an hour, these two boys, and he called these terrified boys on stage, yeah. these two boys filled these two bags. And I was so nervous. I was three rows from the front. I went... Ah. and clapped my hands ah. and it set everyone off oh no and they all applauded and he was raging at them at the mic it's not applause you shouldn't give them applause you should feel shame so i got i got hauled out i thought well he is going to kill me yes now. <laughs> and i did say i'm sorry so i thought you wanted us to, to <laughs> so to, to punish me because i was a savage remember at the time i was wearing um i was wearing levi's and braces 
and dealer boots. So I looked the archetype of pantomime Romany boy. Yeah. Okay. I may have I may have had a stolen child under my arm and a fiddle or something. <laughs> I, I may have done. Somebody's hat. washing. I don't know. <laughs> but um, no, I, I I did look the part, and I I, I was in the. I, was, I think I was in the fourth year at the time, which was, I don't know what it is, year, whatever it is now. Age back, 30, and I should certainly have been wearing the school uniform, but I wasn't. Ooh. So he, he punished me by taking me in, into his office and giving me a notepad and a pencil and said, I want you to write, I want you to write. And it was a foggy day. He said, I want you to write about the fog. So I, That's creative. It, 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 well, he was mad. He was bonkers. He caned somebody once for not walking on the left-hand side of the corridor. I swear. Ooh, blimey. Nobody That's else in the corridor. <laughs> the guy was walking on the right because the class he was going in was on no. the right. But he got the whack for it. Without indicating. Mad. He had a fight with my cousin John on, on the last day of term. He had a fight with him on the disco, discus circle and came out dressed um, in, in uh, polo neck and, and uh, tracksuit bottoms and said, right, his name was John Tanner, the young lad. Right, oh, Tanner, it's been coming for quite a while. It's... Uh, we're going to fight. He brought the school caretakers. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. Me, the headmaster versus you, the boy. Folklore. I read this out. Uh, sadly, John passed away a few years ago. I read it out at his funeral. He had the school caretaker's son as a ref, and they had a fight on the concrete circle. You know when you throw the discus on the concrete? They had a concrete circle. Bare that knuckles. And they, and um, he got quite bash around the headmaster. Yeah. John was a very capable young man. Good. And um, oh. yeah, and that, that, <laughs> really? that was the last day of term. John wasn't going to go in for his lessons. He, he only went there to stop his parents being prosecuted anyway. So, <laughs> so he thought the last day I'm going to lay out here. And uh, yes, and he had a fight. So anyway, he's, he's got me. Pun he's got me on punishment detail. He thinks he's going to humiliate me by getting me to do some crude scratchings on a piece of fool's cap to describe the fog. That he could read out in the so future he could read and out destroy you and yeah. just show okay. what an idiot I was right. at that age. So for once. And the first time ever in, in my schooling, um, I poured it all out. I gave it everything, the most horrendous cliches and florid writing, but I did it. I did, you know, um, about that, how sinister the fog looked and how it rolled into the... Uh, anyway, I poured it all out. Unleashed the iron big potato. I did. I let it, <laughs> <laughs> the Somerset Morgan in me came out. <laughs> so, Dance of the sixpence. So I gave it to him, and his, his response was extraordinary. He's, he looked up at me and he read the first few lines and then he read, read the rest of it. And he said, most absurd thing, he said, did you write this? <laughs> and I just looked over at the desk, which was four feet from him. I did, yes, sir, I, I, I wrote it over there. Because he was busy himself with bits of paper. So he phoned my form teacher, Mrs. Bentley, a fearsome, wonderful lady. He said, Mrs. Bentley, I've got Terry Doe in here. Um, I've asked him to write something for me about the fog and uh, it's... Um, He's actually quite extraordinarily good. <laughs> yes, he said, Terry's, uh, Terry's top at English. He's uh, quite, quite a way ahead uh, in class. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the cliche I expected. <laughs> so he, um, he didn't expect this that at all. He, he dismissed me, but he did get me a bit in the end because he did read it out. Oh. He did read it out. Which so itself is quite embarrassing. Yeah, for I, was a bit, you know, I was a bit of a lad at the time, yeah. wasn't I? I was a bit, you know, <laughs> suddenly, and all that, suddenly there I am, bloody Wordsworth, yeah. all over the place. <laughs> right. It does remind me, you remember that Shirley Valentine moment where she is, it's one of, the, one of the scenes where she's, I think she's very young and she's in school, and, mm. and the headmistress who hates her asks the whole school a question. She's the only one who, who answers it, who knows the answer, puts up her hand, and eventually the headmistress goes, Yes, Valentine, and she gives the right answer. And the headmistress pauses and goes, well, somebody must have told you. Yes, exactly. And she said, of course somebody told you. <laughs> I'm in a school. <laughs> so, all right, so you... When, so when he then, outed me. Then I, was, I was a writer. You're, you're Coleridge, really. I know, you know, yeah, I am. Coleridge really. in pointy shoes. Yes, I'm, no, I was outed then. And I, um, I realised then it, it wasn't something to be ashamed of. It was something to be proud of. You know, I was, I, was, I was on the school football team and I could throw a rounders ball further than most. And um, I was all right with the javelin, but I was more about accuracy yeah. than distance with the javelin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. um, yeah, I was. I was spearing fish with my. Um, oh, you, you could do. Oh of, yeah, yeah. My grandfather used to eat anything: tench, yeah, pike, anything. Yeah, I, I used to bring them back for him. So um, yeah, right. that was can, a can, can we just do, can we just deal with one one cliche of, of, yeah. of Roman life at that time? Hedgehog. Right. I'm going to do this now, and go this, on. this is going to go out to a grateful nation. <laughs> Let me tell you something about hedgehogs. Okay. First, they taste of what? Yes, I have eaten them quite a few years ago. They taste of whatever sort of fat you cook them in. There's virtually no taste to them at all. <laughs> Think about the construction of a hedgehog. It's like a clockwork toy. It's not got any big fat back legs like a rabbit, has it? It's got no, no, no breast meat like a pigeon. Nope. It's got soddle. You cut the back of it off and you cut the spines off. I'll get to that, in the, what you're thinking about in a minute. Yes. You cut the spines off, you roast them, and you sort of nibble bits. There's a, on an entire boar hedgehog, there isn't half a cup full of meat. There's about a half a Yorkie bar of meat 
<laughs> on a whole, and you're going to kill an entire hedgehog for that, even though there were zillions of them in those days. Here's the myth, though. Go from this podcast and be forever informed. We did not ever, not once, not at any stage in our development, bake them in clay. Right? We did not bake hedgehogs you, you in are, clay. You are saying that the whole clay it's idea cobbles. is a myth, a, a legend. Total myth. It right. sounds like if you construct this enormous Ferro Rocher around a <laughs> yeah, I've thing. Seen, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, so you I'm first of it. all first of all, were you gonna pop down the seven eleven and get two stone of clay? No, 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 because you, you obviously you'll count out in some kind of yes. clay mine. Yes, a clay mine. Yeah. Oh Riley, Hit. we have the Lees coming this evening. <laughs> Pop out and, Pop get, out and get, get a wheelbarrow load of clay. Five and a half pounds of clay. So we can better cook the hedgehog. <laughs> and right. I suppose, come to think of it, per hedgehog, you, you need... You're going to need some clay. And a quarter of a tree to yeah, yeah. cope and now, with the right then. All So right. we've got our hedgehog now in this clay. We've got it... We, we've got it what, what are we going to go? Two inches? We've got to have two inches of clay, haven't we, at least? So we've got a nice two-inch coating. So it's just like hedgehog Malteser thing. Now, you build a fire. Yeah, we're good at fire. I can build the best fires in the world. <laughs> I can build just fire out of nothing. Now we're going to put the hedgehog on the fire, okay, presumably with a big fork stick. or So you don't get hedgehog clay tongs. You can't buy them anywhere. Not even in, in, in Waitrose or, or Lakelands. No, they no, don't do them. No, really can't do them. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible emission, so <laughs> Ikea ought to get on it. So you're going to put it cold clay, that's good, on the fire. Yeah. Now he needs a turn, doesn't he? He needs to be turned or he needs to be removed. How are you going to handle this semi-molten ball of clay? How are you going to handle that then? Surely with your charcoal blackened hands. Yes, no? of course you are. Apparently not. Of course you are. No, so okay. you, get it, you get it off the fire somehow. Again, I don't know, two sticks or something like that, and you put it on a sturdy surface. What are you going to do? Now? You give it a, a deft crack, and it falls apart, <laughs> doesn't two, it? In two halves. It falls apart. Taking all, taking the, all the spines with, with it. With it, yes, rubbish. surely. No. Absolute oh, rubbish. I'm a, I'm a, They're cut off with a knife. We're, I've we're, seen it done. We're, suppo we're supposed to improve people's lives here. Not, not. The, you know, the Jews have the blood lie. I would have thought the hedgehog yeah, fib would no, be I'm good. Sorry, I'm no, sorry to ruin not. it. Do you know, though, I've, I've discussed this with people, um, non romans who have, they swear they've seen it. Really? They swear they've seen it. And that, that, what, what's that syndrome, Charlie, that you know about? when you uh, Stockholm syndrome, no? Is, no, no, that's, that's indoctrination. That's what you're doing to me. Yes. That's you Paddy Hurst leave. and all that. No, it's, it's a syndrome where if, if you convince yourself you've seen it, you have, it's your truth. Oh, right, And yes. they think they've seen it. It could be they life, They haven't. Actually. They haven't. They really haven't, okay. The logistics. The logistics. All right. Well, I'm going I'm to ask everybody to, uh, once I got over their disappointment that this doesn't happen, I know, work sorry, it out for guys. themselves. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Now, um, w you are at some point presumably leaving school. Um, yeah. Are you dipping in and out of further education? Do you no. simply get a job as no. e editor of Ergon World uh, no, and the rest of your life is mapped? I went on my last year at school. I took all my mock exams. We did mock CSEs in those days. And I, did it. I thought, yes, I'm destined for stardom here. I'm going to send myself off to university and cut through the posh girlies like a like a, oh, a, combine, uh, a hot combine harvester through, through a field of buttered corn. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be doing. But I didn't. I uh, managed to, to swing um, a work experience placement at Windsor Safari Park. Well, it's a start. Well, I was just in, it was paradise. I was in, par I was in, the, um, in the lions, baboons and cheetahs. Oh, um, magnificent, oh, I see, yes. It was the greatest course. thing ever. And also, uh, it, was, it was alive. I used to get there at silly o'clock in the morning, as I always, always had. But you'd and be enthusiastic with about With my catapult. Yeah. Yes. And I used to get these, these great rabbit pellets from the ostrich house, and so they were hard and they were biodegradable. And I would sneak around the feed bins and shoot rats and mice and give them to the guy who was looking after the snakes oh, and magical. the lizards. So yes. I, in the end, they said, oh, don't, you don't have to worry about being on the gate or anything. Go and shoot around the safari park all day. <laughs> so you were chief, so you, you're actually the only hunter they there actually I was, employed, yes? There I was, in the middle of, of Windsor, Africa. Was Prince Philip looking out of the window going, go away, I wish I was and him. And I'm armed to the teeth <laughs> with my catapult, and um, I'm, I'm shooting rats and mice. What a, what a marvellous job. the greatest but, thing. Now, obviously, that career could have seen you through to the graveyard, but you, you chose no, to, no, to, chose to opt out at some stage. Didn't go back to school at all. Didn't even tell them I wasn't going back, so I didn't go back. Um, had a, a, a selection of jobs. Um, uh, including like uh, suede and leather uh, refurbishment for sketchly cleaners. I was pretty good at that. Well done, you. Yeah, and then I, I went to the airport and got a job as a freight ape, basically the sort of missing link between human and, and primate. <laughs> and I saw the sort of bits of the world on my free flights, and I liked the idea of that. And um, uh, the free flights came about by falling asleep on suitcases. No, no, no. These were entirely donated. They were part of my stipend. Oh, were they? Yes. The modest though it was, you found yourself. Oh, no, it was Delhi brilliant. I was, really? on, I was doing really well. I was a, a warehouseman with overtime in 1980. I was earning, earning 
a, a wage that would have been reasonable today. Golly. Modesty forbids me actually revealing the No, figure, no, fair enough. It no. was good. <laughs> but uh, the only problem was I was, um, I was born with, I'm six foot four, as you can see. I was born with a scoliosis, a 22 degree scoliosis, which is a curvature of the spine. Ah. And it went. Ah. It went big time on a 1500 kilo crate that I was trying to lever Ooh. off a lorry. Um, and it went badly. And I had to, in 1992, I had to have a spinal fusion, which is basically pins and bolts in your, in your spine. And they dropped some titanium rods down to stop it moving. Sadly, I, I was deprived um, a, a career in full contact karate or rugby or skydiving. They told me I couldn't do any of those. Well, so I had to pick something different. A lot of people picked you at six foot four. I mean, I can reveal to the audience, this is, he's actually only four foot two. It's extraordinary. He's, he, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the animals he keeps are actually rare species of hamster. <laughs> Um, okay, no, no, you're not. You're a normal-sized human being, yeah. but you, I mean, you have suffered a bit from that, haven't you? But yeah. so you decided to, you decided to move into the relatively sedentary world of editing magazines. Yes, I did. I got the job through um, a bit of bravado. At a, I took up uh, competitive air gun shooting, and I was in the semi-final or quarter-final of a big competition. I was sitting next to the then editor, a guy called John Fletcher. Yes, I remember. Yes. Lovely man. Yeah. Yep. Lovely man. Um, and he said, "What do you think of the magazines?" And I said, yes, they're, 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 I quite like them. I read them all. I've read every single one from the, um, the first one in August of 77. And um, he said, well, do you like them? I said, yeah, they're right. I said, you need a bit of fresh blood. I said, this sport, field target shooting, isn't being covered. He said, do you write? I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, you push over your essay about <laughs> fog at that point. <laughs> I said, I, I, yes. He said, well, do something. He said, you know where our office is? I said, yes, just down the road from me, because their offices were, they were in Windsor. Windsor weren't they? Yes, and we course. were just down the road. He yes. said, well, this is a Sunday night in Birmingham. I was just getting dark and the, and the finals of the showdown or something were on. And I drove home, I stayed up all night, and I wrote a review of, of a rifle, and I was at his, at his desk the next morning about half nine, with it written out in pencil. And I stood there like an idiot until he read it, and oh, he yes. said, yes, I like that. He said, would you like a regular column? Oh, marvellous. And that was that. And you I were mean, in. The rest I was, was in. history. The well done, you. Right, at that time, we're early 1980s, mid-1980s? Uh, yeah, mid, yeah, 85 to 87. 85 I, to 87. I was involved. It was a high old time for shooting. I yes, mean, terrible things like Hungerford had not happened no, by that no. stage. Uh, we had the golden shot on just appearing yeah, on television. Yeah. I mean, everything seemed to be about right. It feels like... And, and perhaps we could resolve it's not, but it feels like we've been in something like a 45-year decline since then. Um, it depends what you call decline. The, the actual sport, the administration of the sport, the equipment we have to use, I all think, that I think if you were to say to anybody walking around the British Shooting Show today, where do you think f shooting sports are, mm. they might say under attack. Oh, we're under for attack. For example. Yeah, we're under attack. In the 1980s, we weren't. No. We were part of no. the kind of cultural hegemony or whatever no. you call it. It was... In, in those days, and, and a little bit before, I would quite often walk home with my dad from a shoot in the fields. He would have the 12 bore over his arm. I would be distributing rabbits and pheasants and partridges to various old villagers. Grateful uh, old villagers. Yeah, we, have, you know, we, could, need it all. we yes. could need it all. And they, and they would know what to do with it as well. Yes. And it was perfectly normal. If you tried that stunt today, I fear you would, you would be getting blues and twos yes. within minutes. You could not walk through that village with an uncased shotgun. So we can't, so, so first of all, we have to live with the fact that that has happened. Yeah, yeah. But we also have this sort of problem of what you might call social license, that there, mm. in those days, if you went, if you said, I'm gonna go shooting, and people go, that's great, whatever it was, air yeah, guns, shotguns, yeah. scatterpots. And now if you say, I'm gonna go shooting, the perhaps the kind of correct British response would be, oh, really, you know. It's a, it's a bizarre situation. I, I've, I teach many, many, people to, sh to shoot air guns and get, get more out of them and that, that also includes kids. I've had children, I swear this is, this is true, I've had children who said that their, their parents won't allow them to, to come to Bisley under perfectly controlled conditions and shoot an air gun but they can go home in their bedroom and they can blow the wasp name out of anything with virtual and games and, and that's stuff fine, that fine. actually relies on them killing people to earn points and things and well, that's it, okay it's all, a bit weird for always me. a lot to be said for keeping parents well away from children isn't it? I mean, really, they, they have <laughs> no idea it's a bit odd I, I'm, yeah. I don't do all gaming right. stuff but well, well but it happens so yeah. we, we so we have the society we have now 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 please terry give us hope you are you're the doyen of your of your world of your sport mm. make us feel better about ourselves and tell us where we at least could be uh to get right. out of this particular moment. As you know, Charlie, I'm relentlessly positive about all this. I, I accept what threats we have, and you have to know the threats. And you have to also trust those who are defending us. And you're part of it. I'm part of it. 
Um, we have to play a, a clever game and we have to do our absolute best. I think with there's, there's so much to be proud of to be a shooter. You know, when I was a kid, to bring home food for the table was better than scoring a goal for the school football team. It was just that much elevated. It, was, it had a direct practical benefit. A shooter, a proper shooter, I don't care what level he's at, a proper shooter or she, a proper shooter will demonstrate control, skill, consideration for the outside world because you are doing something that, that um, pro literally projects something outside of influence. You do charity work. You, you become a safety module, you, you become a safety officer, you, you accept responsibility and you insist on it in others. There are so many entirely laudable traits about a shooter that need to be promoted. And the negatives are there to be seen in every sport there has ever been. I'm sure somebody's had somebody's eye out with a tiddlywink. In their time, uh, we we record it in rows over it or it, something. I mean, and, and gloriously in Britain, we we record uh, statistically no deaths at all. I think it's, it's it's fewer than one death a year. Therefore, statistically, it's no deaths. And a few years ago, we recorded a slightly better safety record than the sport of table tennis. Yeah, Tra tragic year for ping pong, but it was uh, you know it was good for us. It, so you're talking about citizenship and responsibility. That and also, the, you know, I'm, I'm also I've not lost I've not lost hope in, and that's fairness. I know it's naive. I know that the tabloid media do, don't even have it in their, in their vocabulary and I know they want to sell papers and, uh, I don't know, young gypsy boy does his bit for society, looks after the church, doesn't cause anyone any harm and dies at 85, is never going to make a headline. But there are so many more reputable shooters out there, times thousands, than the idiots we occasionally see plastered over the headlines. And again, I know I'm preaching to the converted. but. We mustn't allow, the wider public mustn't allow themselves to be duped by people purporting to represent us, who absolutely represent the opposite of everything we're about. It's unfair. So keep being us keep is being a message. Keep being proper us. Just keep being us. Have some faith. Embrace the sport. Embrace the positive sides of it. Be a good ambassador. And you, this sport, I, I'm absolutely convinced, this sport in some form or other, albeit a change one, will endure. I love what you say. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to let you go yet because I just want to. I just want to cover a couple, just a couple more things. So I, I must cover carp because one of the joys about following Terry on Facebook is you, you learn a great deal about carp. And actually, sitting next to Aaron here, who uh, you two made a film together about oh, we that. Did. That's carpy. That's carpy. Can we just talk about that? Because the other thing you love is language. You, yes, you know. I love language. T t tell what, what does carpy mean first of all? Well, carpy. Anything that's carpy is a, a sort of the, the distillation of of the, the the spirit that takes you out in a little bivy on the side of a lake and you're there all pioneering. It's nothing like what's happening, really. I mean, I, I go out there with a three... I have a three-course meal, a rather nice bottle of wine, some port and a cheese board. It's, it's, a, it's a joy to look at. It's, yeah, anybody who wants to come on Facebook, have a look. I'm sure there'll be room enough soon. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's carpy. Some people take it to silly, silly extremes where they, they put their rods so close together they actually have to fold the real handles up <laughs> to get them in. And so, so uh, a friend of mine, Tony... and we were just kind of taking the mick out of it, really, as to how, <laughs> how carpy that is. This is carp as an affliction. Your, yeah. your, your own, your own uh, the, the Terry Shed is also well known on Facebook. Yeah, right? the, yeah. This, the this is another masterpiece of, of, uh, of Terryness. Well, that's it's what everyone should have. Every, everyone, man, woman, child, and um, I don't know, Charlie even, should have a man cave, a retreat where you can put stuff on the walls that you couldn't put in your normal house. Indeed. You know, you can't put it. I, I've got my dad's old farming gear, the old. Um, I've got a, I've got a six foot hoe on my wall. Everything in everything <laughs> your man cave has a wonderful story. It has, and, it has and, a and memory. A, and a wonderful story beautifully, beautifully told oh, by you. Oh, yeah. no, we enjoy that. Oh, we enjoy I live that among well. my memories and it, they, they provide the muse as well when I'm writing. That's why I do my best writing, there or outside. Um, and they provide a muse and it's a, it's a sacred space to me. For, for, and for someone who isn't actually sort of uh, properly religious, that's a, it's a centre of worship as well for me. It, it, it is. is. It is. It's, uh, it also comes across as a lot less serious that on Facebook, but I, I do enjoy it. <laughs> Terry, thank you very much for, uh, for giving us uh, uh, your Desert Island Discs. Thank you very much, Charlie. You're a lovely man. <laughs>